Okay, everybody. So today we will talk about the respiratory system. Okay. And the diseases of the respiratory system. First, we'll talk about the anatomy or biology of the respiratory system. Then we'll talk about the clinicals or diseases. Okay? As you know, to understand the disease, you need to understand the biology. First, we'll see the parts or organs of the respiratory system. Then we'll talk about the functions of those parts of your respiratory system. Then we'll talk about the structure of a lung and the bronchioles. Gas exchange in the lung and gas exchange in the body, that means in the tissue. Okay? And then we'll talk about the pathologies or clinical conditions. First, why we need to breathe? Why we need respiration? We take oxygen, right? Mm. You all know that. Now next question is, why your body needs oxygen? Your body needs oxygen because metabolism that occurs in your body requires what? Oxygen. Oxygen. Make sense? So that's why you continuously take oxygen even when you are sleeping, right? Your respiration doesn't stop. So in your body, what happens? Two things we need from outside. Which two things? Oxygen and food, right? Those two things we take all the time. So we need nutrients come from the food, okay, and oxygen. Those two things we get from outside. And inside the body, metabolism occurs. And metabolism requires these two things. And after metabolism, we get what? The most important thing that we get is ATP. We also get heat. Metabolism produces heat, right? You know, when you do exercise, heat is produced, right? Metabolism increases, more heat is produced, right? So we all know that. And small amount of water is produced by metabolism. And these are good things, right? These are good. Also, metabolism produces few bad things. Carbon dioxide and metabolic wastes. Okay? So these are not good. So <coughs> after metabolism, carbon dioxide is produced, right? Which is not good for your body, so it should get out from the body. Is it clear? Oxygen should get in, and who should get out? carbon dioxide and metabolic wastes, right? So most of the metabolic wastes get out through the urine, right? And carbon dioxide gets out how? Through the respiratory system, right? So we inhale and exhale. When we inhale, we take oxygen. When we exhale, we expel the carbon dioxide out from the lung, right? From the body. That is happening all the time. So you understand why you need respiration okay, or breathing. <clears throat> you know, ATP is essential for the body because ATP is the source of what? 
energy. ATP is the source of energy. Now you tell me, if you are not getting enough oxygen, but you are still breathing, but not getting enough oxygen, less ATP will be produced, make sense? Less ATP will be produced and you will feel what? Fatigue, tired, right? You will get tired. <coughs> parts of the respiratory system. If you start from above, go downwards, first organ is the nose. Inside the nose you have a cavity called the nasal cavity. Then next is the pharynx. Pharynx is a muscular tube. Write it down. It is a muscular tube next to the nose or nasal cavity. And pharynx has three parts. How many? Three, three parts. Okay, we will talk about that. Muscular tube, three parts. Then next is the larynx. Larynx is mainly formed by cartilages. So, cartilaginous mainly cartilaginous organ or structure and larynx is called also called commonly voice box why because voice yeah voice box why because inside the larynx you have vocal cords have you heard vocal cords that produce what sound, sound. Okay? So inside the larynx you have vocal cords that produce sound, right? And that's why it is called, also called voice box. Trachea is formed by cartilage and muscle together. <coughs> cartilage and muscle. And trachea is also called wind pipe. Okay. Trachea is also called wind pipe. <coughs> so you see here, pharynx is muscular, larynx is mainly cartilaginous, and trachea is both, right? Cartilage and muscle. Then the lower end of trachea, if you see the trachea, the lower end divides into two branches. So this is trachea, okay? And lower end divides into two branches. These are called primary or main bronchus. Okay, so this is right primary bronchus, this is left primary bronchus, okay. Cus is singular, if I say C-U-S, that means I am indicating one, okay. If you hear chi, C-H-I, that means more than one. So same thing, since we have two, I can say bronchi, okay. If I say C-U-S, CHUS 1. Okay. Uh, now, right bronchus enters into the right lung and left bronchus enters into the left lung. Okay. So, two primary or main bronchi enter into the lung. Right one into the right lung and left one enters into the left lung and then inside the lung they divide again and again it's like tree branch of a tree you know that large branches give many small branches right then small branches give further small branches in the tree 
So exactly like that. After the primary bronchus enters into the lung, it, what happens? Branches. Branches. Again and again. Okay? So, inside the lung, you have many branches throughout the lung. Okay? And these are called bronchial. Okay? Bronchioles. So, bronchioles are small branches of bronchus. Smaller tubes are called bronchioles. Make sense? So, inside the lung, you have many branches. Those are tiny tubes. Okay? And then, the last organs are your lungs. Okay? Now, you have two lungs, you know that, and the lungs are heavily filled with air balls. Each lung has about 150 tiny balls, air balls. How many? 150 million. Each lung, about 150 million tiny balls, air balls. Those are called alveoli. Okay? Alveoli. So, together, two lungs, right, have about 300 million alveoli. Make sense? Tiny balls. So you can now think how small those balls are, right? And those are called alveoli or alveoli, plural. Alveolus is singular, okay? So that is the uh, structure of the respiratory system or parts of the respiratory system, okay? Now, uh, another thing you need to know is the lungs are covered by connective tissue membrane, which is a double-layered membrane, like the pericardium around the heart. You must remember, around the heart, you have pericardium. Similarly, around the lung, you have double-layered serous membrane, very similar to the pericardium of your heart. So it is a double-layered membrane. And this is called pleura. Okay? So pleura is the covering of the lung, which has two layers. Outer layer is the parietal pleura, very similar to heart. Parietal layer or parietal pleura. And inner one, which is attached to the lung, is visceral. Visceral layer or pleural. Okay? So, that is the covering of the lung. <coughs> so, inside the lung, as I have mentioned, primary or main bronchus divides again and again and form the bronchial tree tree-like structure that is called bronchial tree. So what are those branches inside the lung? If you see from larger to smaller branches, secondary or lower bronchi. So the primary bronchus enters into the lung and first divisions are secondary. So primary give secondary or lower bronchi. And then tertiary bronchioles. Bronchioles are small. Then terminal bronchioles, respiratory bronchioles, alveolar ducts, and alveolar. So those are the branches inside the lung from larger to smaller. 
Now, the last three structures that's mean, that means the respiratory bronchioles, alveolar duct, and alveoli. These three are very important. Why? Because gas exchange occurs through the wall of these three structures. All other structures from your nose to the terminal bronchiole are only for the passage of gas. Okay? So you get, take the gas in and out from nose to terminal bronchial. That part is only for what? Passes of gas. Last three parts are for what? Exchange of gas. Remember. So two parts. You can divide the entire respiratory tract into two parts. From nose to terminal bronchial is what? For the passes of gas. Make sense? That's why that part is called conductive zone. Conductive zone. From nose to all the way terminal bronchioles. This part is called conductive because passes of gas. Conductive zone. And then last three respiratory, respiratory bronchial, alveolar duct, and alveoli. These three belong to gas exchange. So, okay. So that's why last three structures are very important. Now, if I see last three structures, this is the respiratory bronchial. These are alveolar ducts like this. See? And alveoli are attached to the alveolar ducts like this. It's like you know grapes you buy from the store. Okay. So now you see this is respiratory bronchial, this is alveolar duct and alveoli. And the duct and the alveoli together is called a sac. So this is one alveolar sac, this is another, this is another alveolar sac. So a duct and the alveoli attached together called alveolar sac. Okay? Gas exchange occurs in these three parts, mostly in the alveoli of the lung. Very important, this one. How many alveoli you have in each lung? 150 million, right? About 150 million. So, gas exchange occurs. So now, for gas exchange to occur, you can think that all these alveoli must have capillary. So if I see only one alveolus, just take one out from here. This is the alveolus, okay? Alveolus is singular. And each alveolus has capillary around it. So this is the capillary, blood capillary. So you see, you have 150 million alveoli in each lung, and those alveoli have capillary around. Make sense? So each alveolus has capillary. So how beautifully everything is structured. So you have blood here inside the capillary. This is the capillary, 
and you have air inside the alveolus. Okay? And you have blood here inside the capillary. And gas exchange occurs between the blood and the alveolus of the lung. Gas exchange occurs between the blood in the capillary and the air in the alveolus. Make sense? Now you all know, everybody, heart sends the blood to the lung, right? Heart sends the blood to the lungs. We talked about that, right? Why blood goes to the lung? To get what? Oxygen. You know that, right? And so blood enters into the lung and gets oxygen from the alveolus. So oxygen goes from the alveoli to the blood because blood is going there to get the oxygen. You know that, right? So blood enters into the lung and gets oxygen from the alveoli of the lung. Make sense? And becomes oxygenated and then comes back into your heart. Make sense? So heart sends blood to the lung, blood gets oxygen and comes back into the heart. Make sense? Then what happens next? That oxygenated blood, heart sends to the body, right? Because your body needs oxygen. So body gets oxygen from the blood. So now if we see what happens in the body, after blood gets oxygen from the lung, then heart sends the blood, oxygenated blood to the body. So, this is the tissue in your body. Your body consists of tissues. So, this is body, tissue, in the body, and capillaries, okay, capillary bed capillary. So blood is here, oxygenated blood and this is tissue. And you all know that blood goes to the body to give oxygen, right? Very simple. So what will happen? From the blood, oxygen will go to the tissue. So O2, oxygen will go to the tissue. Makes sense, right? Is it clear? So blood goes to the lung to get what? Oxygen from the alveoli of the lung, right? So we know that from the alveoli, oxygen will go to the blood. Then oxygenated blood will be sent to the body, right? And blood goes to the body to give oxygen to, to the tissue. We know that. So oxygen will leave the blood. Is it clear? Now, next is very easy. Always remember, this is a rule. Carbon dioxide moves in opposite direction of oxygen. Carbon dioxide moves what? Opposite direction of oxygen. Is it clear? So if you know oxygen is going from the alveoli to the lung, carbon dioxide is doing what? Opposite from the blood to the alveoli. Right? And we expel the carbon dioxide out. Is it clear? Now let's see in the tissue of the body, we know that oxygen goes from the blood to the tissue, right? So carbon dioxide should go what? From the tissue to the blood. Carbon dioxide, okay? From tissue to the blood. So very simple. If you know one, you know another, right? Okay. That blood, deoxygenated blood, will go to the heart and heart will again send it to the lung, right? To get the oxygen and get the carbon dioxide. The same thing is happening again and again, right? Throughout the body. So, this is very important that you understand this, okay? This part is called external respiration. happening in the lung, in the lungs. 
and this part is called internal respiration happening in the body or tissue tissue of the body okay so now you know what is internal respiration exchange of gas in the lung that is external and internal is exchange in the body or tissue okay Okay, uh, now we will talk about, so you see here, four processes of respiration, ventilation, internal respiration, external respiration, transportation. I have already explained to you external and internal respiration. What is ventilation? Very simple, breathing inspiration expiration okay that is called pulmonary ventilation so ventilation is very simple your breathing or inspiration expiration and transportation we know that gas is transported by the blood so blood transports oxygen and carbon dioxide yes so on the board do you have the internal respiration is the exchange in the lung uh, but then up, up on the oh, that, that is that is wrong Okay, it's so internal is the in the tissue, okay? So currently, this is this one should go there. So uh, better you change this one, make it external and make it internal. Yes, good catch. Yeah. So external is yeah, just change it to external and change it to internal. Okay? So external is this one in the lung and internal in the body tissue, okay? And we know that blood transports oxygen and carbon dioxide. Now, you know that respiration has two processes or phases. Inspiration is also called inhalation, right, of air and expiration is also called exhalation. So inhalation or inspiration, exhalation or expiration. So those are two processes of breathing. Now which one is active, which one is passive? This is important, okay? How do you think? Inhalation is active. Yes. Inspiration or inhalation is an active process and expiration or exhalation is a passive process. So this one needs energy, this one does not need energy. Make sense? Remember your lung is highly elastic. Your lung is what? Highly elastic. So, uh, your, your lung is highly elastic. That's why it can do what? Expand and recoil. Make sense? Like this. Elastic thing, right, you use in your clothes, right? You can do what? Expand it. Right? And if you leave the pressure, what happens? Recoils. Right? Your lung is like that. By pressure, it can be expanded. And if you leave the pressure, it will do what? Go back to its actual shape. Is it clear? Okay. So, highly elastic organ. Now you tell me, when you, you uh, know, uh, use the elastic thing in your clothes, you, ca you can expand it by force, right? To expand you need what? Energy. Force. Perfect. Energy, right? To recoil, do you need energy? No. no. You just leave it, right? It will go back by itself, okay? So, same thing. To expand the lung, 
you need energy. That energy is given by the muscles. That force is given by what? Muscles. And which muscles? Respiratory muscles. Have you heard that? Respiratory muscles. Certain muscles of your body in this area, right? Help in respiration. That's why those are called respiratory muscles. So which muscles are respiratory muscles? That helps in inspiration. Diaphragm. Diaphragm is a muscle, remember. It is a flat organ, but it is a muscular organ, muscle. And intercostals. Intercostals. Intercostal muscles. You know diaphragm, right? In between thoracic and abdominal cavity, your diaphragm is here, okay? Inside. So, this is the lung, so diaphragm is here, you see? Just under the lung. And your lung, bottom of the lung is strongly attached to the diaphragm by fibrous tissue, like this, okay? So this is diaphragm. Lung is sitting on it and is strongly attached to the diaphragm. Intercostal muscles are where? In between the ribs. The ribs. Costal means rib. Okay? So inter means in between. So you see here, intercostal muscles are in between the ribs in your case. So these are the ribs. These are the ribs. And intercostal muscles are in between the ribs. That's, that's why they are called intercostal. Okay. Okay. Now what happens? You see how inspiration occurs. Brain sends everything is controlled by brain. You are not doing right. Brain is continuously controlling the respiration, right? So brain sends signal, send signal to the respiratory muscles. So this is the brain, okay? Send signal to the intercostal muscles as well as to the diaphragm. Make sense? When brain sends signal to the diaphragm, diaphragm contracts and moves down. So this is very important to know that when diaphragm contracts, it moves which way? Down. Downwards. Is it clear? Diaphragm contracts and moves downwards. And intercostal muscles, when the intercostal muscles contract, the ribs move forward. Now look at me. Diaphragm moves which way? Down, right? And ribs move forward. Is it clear? So what will happen? I said you that diaphragm is strongly attached to the bottom of the lung, right? So when diaphragm will move down, it will pull the bottom of the lung downwards. Is it clear? It pull like this. So this way, the lung will increase its length because lung is highly what? Elastic. So, this way the lung will expand. Make sense? When the ribs will move forward, that will pull the lung, front of the lung, forward. So, expansion of lung will occur this way. It will go that way. So, the ribs move forward, that moves the front of the lung forward. So, the lung will expand both vertically and horizontally, anteroposteriorly, like this and this. So now you tell me, if you expand the lung, okay, expand the lung this way and that way, then inside the lung, the pressure will go up or down, air pressure, uh, down. air pressure, 
air pressure is going to go down as it expands. If you expand something, same amount of air, you expand, the pressure will go down. If I squeeze, the pressure, you know, if you take a ball and you squeeze it, the air pressure inside will be high, right? If you expand it, pressure will be less. Okay. So that is the goal. Expansion of the lung by the muscles will in decrease the pressure inside the lung. So when the pressure will decrease in the lung, what will happen? Air will get in because outside of the body, the pressure will become high compared to inside because the pressure has dropped here. So that will move the air in into the lung and that is inspiration. That is what? Inspiration. Okay. So inspiration occurs due to expansion of the lung. The air pressure drops, right? Air gets in. Air will always go from high to low pressure. That is the rule, you know that, right? Air moves from high pressure to low pressure. Okay? Make sense? Okay. In your in, in in the tire of your car, the pressure is high or low compared to outside? Inside the tire. High, right? So if you release the ball, pressure, air will get out, right? From high to low. Always not air will not go in. To put the air you have to push force. Right? Forcefully you have to push the air. So very simple. Okay, so that is how expiration, uh, sorry, inspiration, inhalation of air occurs. Now, after that, lung will do what? You have forcefully expanded it, right? So now if you release that pressure, what will happen? Lung will go back to its actual shape. So pressure will gradually increase inside the lung when it will require, make sense? So that will expel the air out. So first part is active, you are expanding, then you are releasing it, squeezing, okay? Again, brain will send signal to the muscles, muscles will contract and will expand, okay? Diaphragm will move down, intercostal muscles will move forward. Expand this way, this way, okay? So that's the mechanism of respiration, okay? So those are the muscles help you in respiration, okay? <coughs> I have already explained this, uh, external and internal respiration. <clears throat> so, only a small part of nose we can see from outside. This is called external nose. Inside it, you have a cavity that is called the nasal cavity. And nasal cavity is separated into two halves by what? Septum, right? Nasal septum. Probably you, all of you have heard, right? The partition between two halves of the nose, right? So nasal septum. And around the nose, you have sinuses inside the bones. So in these bones, you have cavities. Those are called sinuses. So sinuses are cavities inside the bone. Inside the bone. Which bones? The bones around your nasal cavity. Okay? <coughs> and have you heard the term clinical condition called sinusitis? Sinusitis, I think you did. Sinusitis is very common, right? So sinusitis is the inflammation of sinuses, those cavities. Normally, those cavities are filled with air. Normally filled with what? Air. air. Those bony cavities are filled with air. But if inflammation occurs, that is called sinusitis, inflammation of sinuses. And what happens, you see, normally the cavities are filled with air. But when sinusitis 
occurs, inflammation occurs, secretion of fluid takes place okay? and the sinuses get filled with fluid, infected fluid. So the person will have pain, okay, headache, heaviness of the head because a lot of fluid has accumulated right in those cavities. So uh, uh, might have fever. So that's the sinusitis, inflammation of sinuses or cavities around the nose. Where you have the sinuses, these are the locations of sinuses. Okay. So around the nose, inside the bone. And <coughs> now, uh, you remember I said at the beginning that pharynx is a muscular tube after the nose and it has three parts. What are those three parts of the pharynx? Upper most part is called nasopharynx, middle part is called oropharynx and the lower part is called laryngopharynx. Okay, so those are three parts of the pharynx. Just write it down that nasopharynx is behind the nose, that's why it is called naso, make sense? And it is only for the passes of air only for air passes. Oropharynx is behind what? Oral cavity, right? Mouth. That's why it's called oral. And laryngopharynx is below that. And these two parts, oro and laryngo, are for both food and air. So which part is only for air? Nasal. Oro and laryngo are common passes for both food and air. Make sense? The term pharyngitis pharyngitis itis is inflammation I mentioned before, right? Meningitis, tonsillitis, pharyngitis, laryngitis, rhinitis, right? Hepatitis, nephritis, conjunctivitis, itis is what? Inflammation, right? Usually occurs due to infection, bacterial or viral infection. But it can, inflammation can occur by other means, right? If I scratch your body, inflammation will occur, right? That's mechanical. But most of the cases, those happen by bacteria or virus microorganisms. Anyway, so pharyngitis, very simple, is the inflammation of the pharynx. Now, you can see part of pharynx if you ask the person to open the mouth wide and look, put light through the oral cavity, you can see the back of the pharynx, okay? And in pharyngitis, what will happen? If inflammation occurs, you know what happens? Redness, right? Swelling. So you will be able to see that. If you push the tongue down, you can see better, right? Push the tongue down and look, put light and look through it, you will see redness, right? And inflammation there, swelling, and the person will complain what? Pain. Throat pain, right? And pharyngitis usually occurs by the bacteria, bacterial infection, spread to cocci. Okay. Strep throat, strep to cocci. So pharyngitis. <coughs> now, around the oral cavity and pharynx, you have tonsils. So around the inlet of your, you know, uh, digestive system, you have tonsils. The main tonsils are these three types. Arytenoid, uh, sorry, adenoids, palatine, and lingual. 
adenoids, palatine, and lingua. Now, uh, remember, adenoid is also called pharyngeal tonsil. So, another name of adenoid is pharyngeal tonsil. And the term adenoidectomy, ectomy means dissection, cutting, removal. So adenoidectomy is the removal of pharyngeal, surgical removal of what? Pharyngeal tonsil or adenoid. Pharyngeal tonsil. Surgical removal of the adenoid, adenoidectomy. Make sense? Tommy means dissecting, removing.